Here we go. Okay. Welcome everybody to the Contemporary Issues class on a nice, beautiful October morning. <laughs> I'm going to present today on progressive Christianity, also called liberal Christianity. I couldn't find much difference on the internet. So we'll <laughs> talk today about that. We talked recently about uh, traditional Christianity in a class called Jesus and John Wayne that Ron Puning presented. So we thought, let's look at the other side, some of the history and what uh, progressive Christianity believes, how it's viewed today and growing or not too much. Uh, so we will talk about all of that. Uh, but first, let me do the usual announcements. In the lower left corner is the mute button. Please mute yourself when you're not talking. So we reduce the background noise. We are recording this for future playback. They've been really popular. People asking about seeing these videos when they can't be here live. So always want to do that. And lastly, be kind or be muted. Just a request. <laughs> be kind in your <laughs> comments. Okay, before we jump into the topic, as usual, we like to talk about things in the news for a minute. Has there been anything in the news different this week, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, for posterity, uh, we will say that uh, President Trump was hospitalized with the virus this week. It's on the front page of all the things, and he's doing good, and a lot of us are praying for him, of course, no matter which political party you are with, but it sure has stirred up the comments here 30 days before the election. So we're not going to dwell on that very much, but any thoughts, short thoughts we'd like to share on that? Uh, I'd li I like to ask, we, tu we tuned in late, and uh, we couldn't get the service this morning. Uh, do you know what the Third problem service. was? Yeah, they sent out an email 19 minutes before this service began saying that the YouTube service was not working correctly, so they had to switch it over to Vimeo, and I think a lot of us didn't get on. I got on okay, but... Um, it's different for everybody. If you didn't, it's not unusual. But go back and try. Thank you. Vimeo. Did other people have problems this morning? Yes. Linda did and, I, and others. I tried for 15 minutes and finally gave up. That's a sad thing that did happen at the last minute, apparently, like this. But that's the computer era that we are in. Uh, Rev. Jerry talked about the Psalms today in his sermon, which was really good. I encourage you to go back and look at his sermon. Um, and actually, it's a good segue into our topic today because uh, one of his main points was that the Psalms is not the word from God. It is people giving their laments and trying to understand where they are at. And it, Psalms are a section that is addressed to God. So it's people's feelings and thoughts. And uh, that's part of how we see and interpret the Bible, too. So we can talk about that also. Any other thoughts? Anybody been on a big trip like Linda Harmon's been in California driving for three weeks and just got back? We're glad to hear you got back okay, Linda. Yes, I did. Good. Mm -hmm. Today is uh, World Communion Day, so people all over the world are taking communion together today. Mm -hmm. Linda, social distancing. Uh, Linda, how did you find traveling? Uh, you know, I, I imagine you stayed in motels or hotels. Did you find did. that they use adequate uh, precautions? Yes, I felt quite safe. Um, I also traveled with a uh, travel kit of disinfectant and a, a rag and extra masks and <laughs> extra hand wipes. <clears throat> and when I would go into my room, I'd wipe all the doorknobs, all the light switches and all the fixtures, <laughs> including uh, in the bathroom, including the flusher. <laughs> um, all the places had restaurants available. 
um, for takeout and um, I would pick up a meal and take it back to my room and um, gas stations and whatnot um, where I stopped, everybody was masked. Uh, my only fear when before I started was whether I'd get sleepy because I had planned uh, three seven hour days. And mm -hmm. um, what I've discovered is that you don't get so sleepy if you don't stop for lunch. <laughs> so I had a little ice chest on the passenger seat and I had carrots in a baggie and I had pulled off grapes you know, off the stems and a baggie, and I had a baggie of uh, nuts. And so I just snacked periodically mm -hmm. while I was driving. It was real easy just to reach into a baggie and you didn't even have to look. You <laughs> could feel what you were getting. <laughs> Thank you for Linda that uh, information. Uh, we've been thinking about a, a trip, but uh, been kind of hesitant because of the virus, you know. Thank you. Well, that's why I drove, because I didn't want to get on an airplane. Well, I have to add this. I'm thinking about going to California to see my parents in December, and one of my neighbors told me that if you go through New Mexico, they have a list of quarantine states where you have to quarantine for 14 days, and Colorado is on that list right now because it's something like it's over 5% on the COVID mm -hmm. uh, rates. So that was a concern of mine. I don't know. I didn't were... have any problem with any of that. Lots going on. Well, we're proud of you, Linda, for traveling by yourself and doing such a good job. <laughs> That's terrific. Uh, Connie Dix, also hope you are recovering well from your surgery, your shoulder surgery. Glad you're with us today. I am, yeah, yeah, Good. yeah. Good deal, okay. All righty, let's jump right into progressive liberal <clears throat> Christianity versus conservative traditional Christianity. See what we all think, just do, I'll do a little talking today, but let's have a lot of conversation too. Let me start by uh, telling you that I'd like to look at what it is defined as what progressive Christianity is defined as, and I have a just a short Wikipedia piece to show you. And then Harvey Martz also wrote a paper uh, to share with you today, but he's not on the call here yet. Then also want to talk about, uh, of course, have any of you traveled like I have from conservative Christianity to the liberal side, and what made you do that? So I hope you'll share some thoughts like that. Um, what role does empathy play in it? This reminded me that Ron and I have presented on the brain and how empathy and your religious views are shaped by your brain chemistry and structure. So that's part of this discussion also. Are, are progressive Christians really the ones with the brain chemistry that's different from their conservative colleagues? Um, and when we want to talk about the future of progressive Christianity, as well as the split in the UMC over the same-sex uh, religion, same-sex marriage issues. So lots to talk about here. Let me start with uh, what liberal Christianity is, and I want to share with you here, I'll share screen, a little bit from Wikipedia, which was very well, I thought very well summarized. I, see, I hope you can see it here. It says, liberal Christianity, also known as liberal theology, is a movement that seeks to interpret and reform Christian teaching by taking into consideration modern knowledge, science, and ethics. It also emphasizes the authority of individual reason and experience. Liberal Christians view their theology as an alternative to both atheistic rationalism and tra traditional theologies based on external authority. Liberal theology grew out of the Enlightenment and Romanticism of the 18th and 19th centuries, 
It was characterized by an acceptance of Darwinian evolution and a utilization of biblical criticism <coughs> and participation in the social gospel movement. And then skipping down, liberal Protestantism developed in the 19th century out of a need to adapt Christianity to modern intellectual context. With the acceptance of Darwin's theory of natural selection, some traditional Christian beliefs such as the Genesis creation narrative became difficult to defend. So I'll stop there, but I thought that was a pretty good summary of where it came from and what it is. And uh, Wikipedia also talks a little differently about progressive Christianity. It says that progressive Christianity is characterized by a willingness to question tradition, a greater acceptance of human diversity, a strong emphasis on justice and care for the poor, and environmental stewardship of the earth. Progressive Christians have a deep belief in the centrality of the love one another passages. And this leads to a focus of compassion, justice, and mercy. This prominent movement is by no means uh, the only significant parts of these beliefs are not the only significant parts, but the most uh, visible parts of the liberal progressive wing. Does the origins, a priority of justice and care for the downtrodden are recurrent themes in the Hebrew prophetic tradition that was inherited and led to the development of progressive Christianity. This has been reflected also in later Christian traditions and also in political trends, such as the progressive movement and the social gospel, which were direct political movements. In recent years, it says the ascendancy of the conservative evangelical movement in the U.S. challenged many people in mainline churches. And one of the leaders of progressive Christianity was Jim Wallace of Sojourners, who rejected uh, the methods of the conservative Christian movement. And he also spurred others to put together a progressive Christian network in the 90s. So, and then it goes on and talks about that. But I'd like to stop there and see what you think about that. Does that sound like a fair definition of what progressive Christianity is? Anybody agree or disagree? I agree. Sound I like think it focuses on the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Also, a short piece, too, that I thought was interesting. It says, uh, another good working definition is in Roger Wolseley's book called Christianity for People Who Don't Like Christianity. In it, he says that progressive Christianity uh, proclaims Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth as the Christ, emphasizes the way and teachings of Jesus, not merely his person emphasizes God's mediacy in our lives and our world, not merely God's visiting earth as Jesus, leans toward pantheism, but is not exactly that. I mean, pantheism meaning uh, that God is in nature and everywhere. Uh, Progressive Christianity emphasizes salvation here and now instead of primarily in heaven later. And it leads to a robust belief in caring for the earth and the current life, but does not discount the possibility of a future afterlife. So that was another one, another way to look at it. <clears throat> Even one of the things that, one of the things that has struck me is uh, the need to uh, distance ourselves or distance uh, what uh, pro progressive or, or, or our tr train of thought from liberalism. 
and that lib the word liberalism has been made into a a uh, a bad word, and uh, I think that that has to do with the uh, the problems that we had during the '60s and a lot of other overreactions that people latched onto and said, "Well, that's the liberal. Uh, that's what happens when you adopt a liberal train of thought." But liberal is a, is a good word, and the word progressive to me uh, is almost uh, uh, off-putting because it it says that. Uh, we're interested in progress and not necessarily in maintaining our traditions and not maintaining the foundations that we strongly believe in. Uh, I think that the liberal, the, li the word liberalism is much, much better because it implies freedom, freedom to, uh, for each believer to seek his own way. And it, and it has always bothered me that that uh, we on the left have been so willing to drop the word liberal. Uh, I, I think uh, liberal Christianity connects faith with works, uh, the, with the way you live. I think uh, you see much of Christianity, their, their faith uh, doesn't have anything to do with how they live, it seems. Uh, and I think uh, liberal Christianity, uh, you know, makes you a practicing Christian, hopefully. <laughs> Much of the focus is on that. But Jim does bring up a good question. These terms are loaded and they tend to polarize us on the left and the right into categories, these camps that we see each other as enemies, conservatives, don't like liberals, and vice versa. And it's all tied in with our political views also. What do you think about these terms? Lois, go ahead. Well, I think that it's each individual has their own feelings toward God and toward themselves and toward our fellow men. And I think it should be individually what you want and what you feel, and not in a category of either, either of the two park places. I'm not in the park. I don't want to be in the park. I want to be in my wiry relation to God. And I live with God. I live with him every day, walk with him, run with him, drive the car with him. So I don't see how you can categorize it so much. Well, there's also the third category that we could talk about, the moderates, the middle way between the two. And uh, one of the primary pastors and evangelists on that is uh, the pastor from Kansas City, Rev. Adam Hamilton, the pastor of the largest Methodist church in the country. And he uh, does a good job of balancing almost equally conservatives and liberals in his church and still coming out uh, with a successful message in church. So he does a good job of staying out of either camp solely. <clears throat> Lola, go ahead. I've been labeled as an extreme centrist. <laughs> so I just thought I'd throw that in. And, <laughs> and I like the, the connection between liberal and um, ethics and empathy. Okay. What do people mean when they call you an extreme centrist? Um, that would mean that people have trouble nailing down exactly my position because it's not hard right or hard left. Mm -hmm. And, right. and I, I kind of, yeah, prefer to judge each idea, each person, everything on its own merit, not by a, a label. Do you think there's some relation equivalent to that when we look at politics in Colorado where more people are independent today than are either Republican or Democratic registered? I think, yeah, that group has grown tremendously recently. I do. Very good. Okay, let me <coughs> share with you Harvey's paper that he wrote and 
I don't see Harvey on here at the moment, but if he is, uh, speak up, Harvey. And I'd like to just share the highlights with you of that. Harvey shares the traditional Christianity compared to progressive Christianity and what are the basic assumptions, beliefs. He says, number one, uh, traditional Christians believe the Bible is literally true. It's inerrant and infallible. The Bible and its teachings are not to be questioned. Two, the virgin birth is an essential doctrine. Three, the substitutionary atonement is an essential belief that uh, Jesus died as a substitute for our sins. Number four, salvation is only by going to heaven and not going to hell. After death, the focus is only on the next world. And five, only those who claim Jesus as Savior will be saved. Others are sent to hell. This is the pretty conservative side. Uh, six, Jesus will return to earth in the future and only take Christians who will be redeemed and go to heaven. And seven, God is a supernatural being who never changes. And then compare that to progressive Christianity. Harvey feels, number one, the Bible contains the word of God and the words of today or the contemporaneous culture. Teachings about slaves obeying their masters, women are second class in order to be silent, passive, and obedient. Same gender sexual behavior is universally condemned, thought to be an abomination of God and only a reflection of the first century culture, not eternal and universal. The Bible is trustworthy, but it also contains diversity of thought and different versions of the same story. Pointing that out. And number two, I know this is important and well worded, I thought, by Harvey. Jesus is the benchmark to help us determine what is eternal and what is time limited in Scripture. Three, God is distinctively present in the person and event of Jesus, but we can also know God in other ways. Paul says in Romans that we can know and experience God through the wonders of creation and not only through Jesus. God is not limited to Jesus. He's bigger than one thing. And Jesus subordinates himself to God and says, he, Jesus, does not know everything. There are some things that only the Father knows. Eternal life is not in heaven after we, is not in heaven after we die, but is a quality of life available to us right now and later as well. Five, addition of the stories in the two Gospels about the Jesus' virgin birth and other stories have differing versions. Compare Matthew and Luke and other people, other persons in the first century that had a virgin birth, was claimed by Roman emperors. Uh, the truth of Jesus' unique relationship with God in the Bible is not the virgin birth, but the resurrection. And Jesus died because he was seen as a mortal threat at the stagnant religious establishment. I won't read all that. I'll skip through here. There's less emphasis in progressive Christianity on the divinity of Jesus and more on the humanity of Jesus. Following Jesus does not mean giving assent to some doctrines and dogmas about him. Number nine, God calls us in Jesus to invite others to consider joining us in the Christ-like life. And finally, God is in process also and can change in response to God's creation. We are surrounded in God and in God we live and move and have our being. And I would just note in process that term, Rev. Mark teaches a class called Process Theology in which he says that uh, he believes the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us and that we are a work in process with uh, history and our own free will and that God continues to reveal uh, how things should be and that we should not simply conserve and lean on totally the beliefs from the past. So we are in a process of changing all the time. And there's some of the advocates of progress Christianity. Of course, some of these uh, we know about. Marcus Borg, 
uh, John Dominic Crossan, a lot of these we've studied in classes at St. Andrew. Bishop Spong is controversial in some ways. People think he goes too far in his liberal beliefs. Some do. Richard Rohr is highly popular, a, a Catholic priest on the liberal side of interpretation. We've had, uh, what do you think? At, at uh, St. Andrew, I don't think we've had any of the others at St. Andrew. Yes, probably true. What did you think of Harvey's comparison, conservative versus liberal? Any parts jump out? <clears throat> well, I've just finished reading. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. okay, Go ahead. I've just Mo finished reading a book called Finding Your Way Through the Bible. And uh, the book... It, it emphasizes that those who put the words down, those who wrote, lived in that day. Our day is very different, but what, what they're saying to us is not different. And we need to apply it to our lives now. You know, the way we're living now is different than it was in those days. But the, the general facts underneath it, about Jesus, about all of the things that it talks about in the Bible, Take a good look at Revelation. And they were, the guy wrote it, John, he's, he's writing it to the people of that day. And we have to know that to understand what it means. The seven doesn't mean much to us, but to them, it does. So take that into account and f make it work for us, but not for them. I mean, they had it then, and now we are now. I don't think I'm a progressive. I don't think I'm anything. I'm just living my life with God. <laughs> That's it. Very good. Ron. At its, unmute, most, Ron. at its most extreme, uh, the, the far right wing of Christianity could be, could be called the All Souls Fire Insurance Company. Yeah. Just to a great extent, it, it emphasizes... Uh, you need to sign this contract with God to prevent you from uh, burning in hell. Uh, on the other side, there's the thought that, well, no, your religion shouldn't be a contract with God, but it should be an inner uh, change that puts the emphasis on caring for others and empathy instead of fear about your own uh, contractual relationship with God. Factual relationship. That's an interesting comparison. I like that. Dave? Uh, yes, go ahead, Linda. Um, I like what Harvey wrote, and I would like to have a copy of that. Is there some way of doing that? I will send that out to all of you. Thank you. We'll do an attachment. Um, I think speaks, it's interesting. He speaks my language. Yes, he speaks. <laughs> He does a good job of summarizing and speaking our language. Um, I think it's Steve. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. That I, one of the things that I wanted to bring up in this discussion, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, but uh, I think it's uh, important to take a look at our hymn book uh, and the evolution of our of our faith uh, and how many of the old hymns that we sing often, uh, uh, hymns written by Martin Luther um, and other uh, people, are hymns that are, are quite uh, obsolete in so, many, in so many ways, because Luther was at a time when uh, God was thought to uh, uh, be a puppet, a puppet master, master and, and we nothing more than dancing on the end of the string and doing what was going on and, um, and not having any kind of free will and how the hymns have, have largely evolved over a period of time. The important thing to me anyway is the fact that we still sing those old hymns. And the reason that we sing those old hymns is not necessarily to absorb every word as it is included in 
every part of the lyric in the, in the hymn, but to maintain a contact with our foundational, um, our foundational theology, even though we may not totally agree with it now, we still maintain that contact. And I think that's important that that, that contact, even though, you know, I, I think that we're in great danger or that conservatives believe that we are in great danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I think many times we progressives or liberals uh, are afraid that we're uh, going to do the same thing. And so we maintain the bathwater too. What I'm saying is that it seems to me that, that we need to encourage more thought uh, when we are singing the hymns and when we are practicing our religion, uh, rather than just absorbing it on face value that we be encouraged to think about what we are doing when we are worshiping, when we are singing the hymns. Um, and uh, I think that, good point. That, that the religion itself uh, if you just look at the historical documents that you can see the modification and the progression that we are, that we have, have been following. It's a good point. And Jim, it reminds me of, uh, we still say the Lord's prayer with the words, uh, Lord lead us not into temptation as though the Lord leads us into bad things. When the Pope himself has said, let's change that poor wording to be more accurate with our beliefs today. So I'm kind of curious why the United Methodist Church has not changed the way we say that part of the Lord's Prayer. But good point. Very good points. I want to read something. To go one, step, to go one step further, I thought it was rather funny this morning during worship. I'm sorry other people didn't see the worship, but I thought it was rather funny that uh, when we were singing, when we were singing the opening hymn, uh, all of the sexist language uh, that had been included in the original hymn had been uh, had been modified by the people who were singing, but it had not been modified by the printed uh, text that was on the screen. And so while while uh, the singers were saying one thing, we were reading it something else. And that goes to another, to the same thing that you just said, Steve, that the, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer contains quite a bit of sexist language. And I was, the, the funny story that I have is that I heard a sermon many years ago that, that said uh, all about sexism uh, in our lives and how God didn't want uh, this inequality to exist. And immediately after the sermon was over, we said the Lord's Prayer with our Father in heaven. Yeah. Good point. Good uh, point. Steve, this is Jane Watson. Go ahead, Jane. Off, off camera, but I'm always here. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we were be to transported back to Jesus' time and his teaching and preaching, which of these would he be? Good question, G. Uh, Jane, it, was Jesus a conservative or a liberal or neither? Neither. <laughs> well, I think in his day, uh, he was talking about some reform to what people had been preaching and teaching in the Old Testament. And so that was kind of going off on another branch of uh, uh, what his thoughts were, how he was interpreting it, and people in his day may have considered him more liberal than conservative because he was trying to uh, enlighten them about what the Old Testament was teaching. So in his day, he was probably more liberal than conservative, to use our terms. Or a radical. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so. yeah Steve, I was just, if I may. Steve, Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I think, um, I can't help but think that Jesus was a liberal, only from the standpoint that he, he preached other centeredness. And I don't see that coming from the right. Other centeredness is something apart from self. And, and so, in fact, I've often thought how the conservative churches 
rationalize some of the things they're doing uh, and all their wealth and everything else, and then preach the, cons or the, the liberal gospel. Uh, th this would be in particular the conservative uh, uh, Methodist churches in the wealthier areas. Uh, they come from a conservative background. They have tons of money, yet they're, uh, uh, the staff at the church is uh, very liberal. And I just think it's, it's confusing to me how they can do that and, and maintain that peace of mind. I, I don't see that. I can see a liberal congregation and a liberal, uh, um, what do you call it up front? What do you call that? Uh, clergy, a liberal clergy. But I do not see how they can keep it straight. If they have a liberal uh, clergy and you have a conservative um, parishioners, I, I, I find that very mm -hmm. difficult. Anybody have that same problem? I, I've seen that. I've been in three Methodist churches and uh, two conservative and one liberal. This is the most liberal. And so um, I think the parishioners here are much more consistent with the, the clergy, but not in the two other churches. So there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Mark would be happy I said that. <laughs> Good point, Bill. That's the the line, the balance that a lot of pastors have to do, have yeah. to try and tow. How do they keep both sides happy, so to speak? Yeah, really. Yeah. Well, think about the slavery situation. The Bible is full of slaves. And well, uh, people that we know very well from the Bible had slaves and thought it was perfectly all right. That's all changed now. So if you, when you're reading the Bible, and it says that in this book, you've got to think about the times that we're in. We don't think that being a slave, we don't think that women should be under men, you know, mm -hmm. uh, coordinate at all. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's different in, in, the, in the ways that we live in our society from the ways they were biblically. So, you know, you live your own life in this day and age, you don't live your life in that day and age. But the Bible is full of good things that relate to all of us that time and now time and all time. And what Jesus talks about is, is right for us now and then and always. So take it for yourself, you know. That's what it says. <laughs> well, let's throw out that question. Um, are there... Other folks besides me who started out as a conservative and very uh, certain we thought of doctrine. And then as we got older and learned more, we became more liberal and more accepting of the mystery. I think from what I've heard, it's fairly common for this to be our journey. But uh, has anyone else done that besides me? I began as a Lutheran and then a Nazarene when I was young and then... Hmm. Uh, eventually a Methodist. I think Winston Churchill said that the tradition is the other direction, Steve. Mm -hmm. I think he said that you're, you're uh, supposed to be a liberal when you're young and a conservative when you're yes. old. But yes, but I yeah. can't remember the exact quote. But. Yeah. Steve, I followed a similar path as you. I was born and raised in a small town of 500 people in a Presbyterian church. And so the whole community was, in fact, very, very conservative. And it wasn't until after marriage and, you know, um, giving more thought to this that I became uh, much more liberal in my logic and acceptance. Mm -hmm. Well, some of this is putting a label on us. Am I conservative or not? Am I, what am I, what's, am I uh, Democrat or Republican? Yeah, you, you have to have a label. I don't, no. <laughs> well, but at the heart of it too, we often hear is uh, our willingness to change. And we, liberals, of course, to use that phrase, say that conservatives are not open-minded, are not willing to um, take new information and make changes when Jesus, in fact, said um, that we are to question our faith and our beliefs. And he said, you've heard it said that 
we do things this way, but I say we should do things another way. And so that he was modeling for us that it was okay to question. Absolutely. Right. I, my question uh, or my comment going back to the original question about whether Jesus would have been conservative or liberal, I don't think he would have been either one. I think he was a Jew. Oh, he started yeah. off being a Jew and he ended up being yeah, a, Jew, was a Jew. And he was, I yeah. think he would have been very he surprised was. about about all the religion that was that came from his <laughs> life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's eleven fourteen. Let's talk about uh, the future of progressive Christianity and churches like St. Andrew. Do you think we are well positioned to be a place where young people especially will gravitate with our message? Or do you think conservative Christianity will continue to draw more people as it has in the last 30 years? I asked this question to uh, an ILF scholar who's been doing a class at St. Andrew, Albert Hernandez. Just the last three, three weeks he's done a class and Albert said, uh, he thinks that, yes, the progressive Christians are positioned for being a welcoming place to the young people today who will make up the bulk of the future Christian membership and that they naturally accept uh, gay people and others and they will be looking for a place when they're in their 40s and 50s where they can come and get uh, tradition and progressive accepting doctrine also. Steve? Yes, Lo Linda. I think the problem that um, progressive Christianity has is breaking into the so-called non-believers. Um, I, I see that group as the one that's growing so, uh, so rapidly. And I think part of the problem is, um, and I'm thinking of some of the members of my own family, is that uh, they think Christianity is the conservative view. And they don't understand a more progressive or liberal view. And so they feel like, well, I can't buy into the conservative one. And so I think the whole religion thing is a bunch of bunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. The surveys show that many people more are going to the none, the no religious affiliation category from both sides, the conservative and the, re and the liberal sides of the religious spectrum. More are going to that, wanting to be spiritual, but not religious. Steve, I tend to, I, I really agree with Linda. I think that the, that the conservative um, energy uh, permeates the entire market until most people who are unchurched start thinking that one size fits all, that anytime you're a Christian that you, that you uh, subscribe to all of the uh, literal doctrine that, that comes out. And I think that's very off-putting. I don't think that we liberals are very good at uh, reaching out, at differentiating ourselves, uh, making ourselves look um, uh, have a different a different approach and a different face. I think Christmas in the park does a long goes a long way to do that. I think our outreach efforts go a long way to helping, but I think they're they're very very minor, minimal, and I don't think they're they're lasting. I don't think that they that they reach uh, the uh, people who will come after us uh, effectively. Um, I, 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 Jim, I think what we're talking about uh, has a lot to do with age. Uh, we old people, um, you know, we, we think in terms of the past all the time. Whereas young people, they don't have a past. Their, their aim is in the future. They have vision for the future. And they look at the past and they, they see all the problems that we have created or lived with. 
and uh, they they want to change. Uh, they want to do things differently. So uh, I have great hope with the youth of our, of our country and of the world, actually. Uh, you know, uh, our future is our, our life in the future. Our life is not in the past. I totally agree with you, Jim. Yeah, this is Terry. True. I'd like to say something. Send oh. our youth leader has people in her group that meet with high school kids at a number of our schools at least once a week. <coughs> and the youth today, their peer group includes everybody. And our church reaches out to the youth very well. We have programs about suicide and a number of other programs. But Cindy is doing a very good job. There's at least two high schools that I'm not sure she's at Arapahoe, but she's at uh, Mountain View in Douglas County. And they meet once a week, at least once a week with these kids. So we are doing a great job reaching out to our youth program. And I don't think that is pushed enough as to about that effort that's going on there. Mm -hmm. Mark is doing a very good job reaching out to families and kids. Uh, that shooting at that STEM school is a very good example mm -hmm. of what our church did for the community. Mm -hmm. And with the su suicide that took place at Arapo High School, so we are we are working with these youth people more than some of you think. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to your own grandkids, I mean, all of us have grandkids, I suppose. You learn a lot about how they think in these days. You know, I think our church is doing good things. I really do for the teenagers. There's, well, I don't mean uh, to imply. I don't mean to imply that our we're not trying, uh, but my concern is whether we're succeed, succeeding or not. And my judgment is based upon the fact that when I sit in the choir, I look out at our congregation, and looking back at me are a bunch of white faces. <laughs> Almost all of the white faces are people that are. Uh, over 30 years old, and most of them are over 50 years old. Sure. And I right. get concerned. I get concerned about the fact that we are very, very uh, homogeneous, mm -hmm. homogenous, if you will, and that, and that we are not doing, that we are not being effectively uh, effective in our reach out to make our our church a colorful church, a church with lots of different. Uh, people that we can draw on their experience and, and on their knowledge and on their history. Uh, and that, that's the basis of my, of my judgment. That's an important topic. Also, a uh, related question too, Terry and Jim, and I know we've brought this up before. Do you think that St. Andrew and other progressive churches should be more publicly visible and active should they be putting should we be putting signs in the in the grass that say black lives matter or yes. other things yeah. uh, as for example uh, catholic churches put signs about abortion in their property and put white crosses on their lawns mm -hmm. to be more visible on their belief yes this is terry i asked mark about that and at the moment, he said he didn't want to raise too many red, too many flags around here. But he was asked specifically that question. And he, yes, but perhaps uh, now that we're going to be out of debt, maybe we can take a little, few more risks. <laughs> <laughs> I like that attitude. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Since we do have conservative and progressive people in the congregation, would that be something that you'd have to take a vote on, for example, see if there's a consensus of people that want us to be more publicly visible and having signs out? Uh, Steve, uh, just 
just uh, a comment with regard to that. I, I think you got to uh, separate the political from the religious. I really can't see us going into the political realm. Uh, it gets to be uh, kind of sticky there. Um, yes. That's Did Jesus care about that? I don't. Yes. I, I with all due respect, I disagree. I believe our namesake was extremely was yes. extremely political. Okay. I believe that <clears throat> it's important that we at least try to do the right thing, regardless of whether uh, it may it may be off putting to somebody. I think that we have to do the right thing. It's a little bit like saying um, being against slavery, being against being against uh, 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 people of, of a different sexual uh, orientation, being uh, against uh, all sorts of things that are that are on the face of it are wrong. Those are political issues, but they I believe they are also religious issues. And I think, in my personal opinion, as most of you know, in my personal opinion, the most pressing theological issue that faces uh, our church and, uh, worldwide is the environment. And we need to be accepting that as as a religious issue. Mm -hmm. The, the root if, word of, of politics goes back to people. And politics is about people. I, I think we can be uh, political without being partisan. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, uh, signs, we might have a sign that says, uh, Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, all life, all human life. Mm -hmm. Is matters. Good point. Uh, just Jim. a thought. Just a, one more thought on that. I, and forgive me if I'm overdoing this, but I think we got. Uh, I'm kind of like uh, Steve. I come from a very conservative uh, background, way back when, very conservative community. And uh, I, I grew up in a Presbyterian church. Eventually, went to the left. But um, you got to be careful of the culture. That's what they taught me. You, uh, you know, in, in the conservative realm, you, uh, you're you fighting the culture at all times. And so uh, that kind of pervade, gets me thinking in terms of uh, uh, not letting the political intervene here. I'm not saying outreach. I think outreach is part of the other centeredness, and that is so important. But when you get into political, that's not outreach to me. I think uh, environment, that's not political. I agree 100% with that. Good point. Well, it's all a good question. There's pros and cons. Many people are in there. All, all good. Well, we've got about four minutes left. Any final thoughts on conservatism, liberalism, middle way? 20, looks like 21 or 22. You know, the middle I way. I have a thought I'll share. Go ahead, Kim. I personally think that there's too much emphasis on defining, you know, is this conservative or liberal? And, you know, the things I've enjoyed about St. Andrew have been in the arts. You know, I was in a harp concert there. I've had paintings up on display. I had a quilt on display. Um, you know, why does politics have to enter everything? You know, when I'm watching a uh, you know, a tennis tournament, why does that have to become political? You know, it should be about tennis. And, you know, one of the things I've enjoyed about the church is, is and I think other people would agree, is the music, the arts, the, you know, and that's decidedly unpolitical. So I don't understand why it seems like in this day and age, politics has to enter every realm. And I get a little bit exhausted by by politics entering sports, entering religion, entering the arts. You know, why can't we just mm -hmm. become apolitical and embrace, you know, doing things rather than yeah. taking a stance, you know, a political stance on everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the Academy Awards. If you win for acting, you have to give your political speech before you accept your award <laughs> these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a very uh, good Steve point, Kim. Steve? Yes, go ahead, Keith. Thank God for artists. Yes. Um, you, you, early in the, in the hour, you commented about Church of the Resurrection. 
And I've admired Adam Hamilton and his writings and the, the classes that he prepares for churches all over the world, basically. How does he navigate this, uh, this field full of minds that, that we're talking about? He seems to do it more successfully than anybody. Well, part of it is his, just his personality also and his openness and not condemning either side. Uh, it, he often says that uh, there are good things in both sides that should be taken into account and we should use all good thoughts wherever they come from. So that's part of it. But he also doesn't push the liberal uh agenda, so to speak, even though he personally is leading the church in that direction, in my opinion, Keith. He, he has led it from a conservative position uh, of not accepting mm -hmm. LGBT mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. very much accepting. And so I think, I think our church is very good at accepting different lifestyles, sexual lifestyles in that. And I'm very happy because I am touched by that a little bit in my family. So it matters to me, you know, and I, I bet it does, does to a lot of people. And I know of churches not far from us. It may look like they are very, very open and they are not really. If you have a different sexual type of life, you're not welcome there. Mm -hmm. I know that. So our church is very good at that. I like that. Well, I think as a lot of you have said, your your thoughts have changed over the years. And I think it's a learning process. You know, you talk about the slaves, you talk about the, uh, yeah. the women's role and many other roles. It's been a learning process. It's been a changing process. And I think we have to help mm -hmm. others in that thought process, mm -hmm. not just push the other side away. Right, exactly. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, it's 1131. We need to wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for such a good discussion. Any final thoughts? <laughs> I will send out uh, Harvey's paper that he prepared to all of you. And thanks, everybody, for being with us today. Let's pray for Trump and Biden and people on all sides and for our church, too. Thanks. Thanks for your leadership, Steve. Bye. Thank you, Jim. Good job. It's always nice Bye. to have a good discussion like this with you. Okay, Thank next you, week Steve. is uh, Ron Puning's going to present on the ballot questions in Colorado. So that will be helpful for our voting knowledge. And then the week after is Rev. Mark Feldmeyer going to be with us again to talk about all things church related. Okay, we'll see you next week. Thanks for hey. tuning in. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.